This is John Cullo with OKRaw.com to have another exciting episode for you. In this episode, we're going to be answering your guys' questions. You guys do have a question for me. You want to post it on my community tab, the link down below for that. And you may get chosen for next month's Q&A. Anyways, on with this month's questions. First question is from Paul Thomas, 5241. Hi, John. I was wondering if you could talk about if you soak or grind your flax seeds. I cannot find any answers anywhere about what to do about enzyme inhibitors. Also, on chia seeds, when soaked, do the enzyme inhibitors stay in the water because I can't remove the water? It's all gooey. I'm taking the flax oil from a good, fresh company, but I would rather have it naturally. Thanks. to he- Love to hear your thoughts. All right, Paul. So, you know, for me personally, like... You could worry about enzyme inhibitors, and for most of my raw food career, pretty much I have not worried about, you know, phytates or enzyme inhibitors and all these things. Like, I don't think it's a big deal unless you are making a large portion of your diet out of these foods. That being said, you know, flax seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds, nuts and seeds make up a smaller part of my diet. They're not a big staple. Some raw food diets, they're a staple, and if they are a staple and you're eating a lot of them, you probably might want to be a little bit more concerned about the phytates and the enzyme inhibitors and all these things. So what I'm going to tell you, what I'll tell you guys is this, like I just take my flax seeds, they're raw. I grind them, usually dry grind them. I add them to things. Uh, Sometimes I'll put flax seeds in my dressings or soup mixes that I blend up. Sometimes I'll grind it up with like oats, like sprouted oats and make like a dessert out of it, you know, to have less, uh, you know, seeds and a little bit more, you know, fiber and benefits from the oats. Um, also with the chia, I mean, pretty much you can't get, it gels up. So you're, you're not really going to get any enzyme inhibitors out. So, you know, here's the thing, like, personally, I wouldn't really worry about it. I mean, that's just my overall consensus. I mean, you could start worrying and, and nitpicking the enzyme inhibitors, but there's far more important things, I think, in life, like, you know, sourcing higher quality fruits and vegetables. All right. That's my, my thoughts on that. All right, next question from a CM-UI1DT. Hi, John. What are your thoughts on fulvic and humic acid in supplementation and in gardening? So first, the easy part is gardening. So I definitely believe they should be used in gardening. I use actually like uh, soil humates, like little like black, you know, little round soil amendments to put in my soil mixture. So that's how important I believe it is. And, you know... Fulvic and humic acid supplementation for your garden can be quite beneficial. I like to use it as a foiler spray after my plants are in the ground. There's many different brands and everybody, every brand will say ours is the best because we extracted this proprietary method and all these things. And, you know, I use a product called uh, Mr. Fulvic, Mr. Humic. Link down below if I remember the video where I discuss this on my gardening channel. Uh, that being said, I don't discuss this too much on my uh, raw food channel. So getting it into supplementation, you know, definitely if you are going to supplement it and put it in your human body, then you definitely want to make sure and pay attention of the source. I do believe that there can be health benefits to using these substances in the human body as proven by science. If you're taking it internally, I'd mostly focus on the fulvic acids, not soil, uh, not the humic acid. And I currently take a, you know, gut ion a supplement which is supposed to help with tight junctions uh, in my gut microbiome so i think it can have a place you know once again this should be a supplement to a healthy diet i mean it shouldn't replace eating healthily you know and for some people you know you may not even need it i don't know <laughs> so that's what i'll say with that i take it occasionally it's not a regular thing i take on any uh, consistent basis all right the next question is from a uh, user cs1xz IYO, in your opinion, what is the best method of making banana ice ice cream in a blender, juicer, yananas, etc.? All right, so there's many ways to make banana ice cream, and the method you think is best may not be the method I think is best, right? So it really depends on what is most important to you when making your banana ice cream, right? Is the texture the most important? If texture is most important, then I would tend to move towards using something like a champion juicer with a blank plate or something like a Norwalk juicer or pure juicer with a grinder attachment. That makes the perfect consistency nice and fluffy, right? If you don't want it to oxidize as quick and you don't want it to melt as fast, then I would use a slow cold press juicer, such as the Santa 707 that I recently reviewed 
on my YouTube channel. Cold pressed juices are going to kind of crush it up and not make it too fluffy. So it's not going to melt as fast and it's going to have a more thick texture, right? For me personally, I really dislike using something like a food processor or even a blender with a tamper to make the banana ice cream. To me, that, add, that super oxygenates the ice cream which can add a nice fluffy uh, texture. But the issue with that is now you're really activating the polyphenol oxidase. So if you, if you should mix berries with it, you're going to have, you know, less uptake of the berry nutrition polyphenols in your bloodstream after you eat it, in my personal opinion. This is based on a study that they did around smoothies. Of course, probably the best way to do it is to not make ice cream at all, but to actually put the bananas in a vacuum blender with enough water to get it to blend up under vacuum to not oxidize it at all. And of course, I also want to recommend, you know, when you freeze your bananas, you want to freeze them in vacuum sealed plastic bags or other vacuum sealed, um, you know, jars or containers, right? Links down below to my Amazon shop where I share the actual, you know, vacuum bags I like to use and to freeze my bananas in. So yeah, I hope to have a video one of these days on all the different methods to make banana ice cream so I could share with everybody like the differences that each equipment you use can make. I mean, and, and you know, the thing is this, find the method that works best for you. Like right when I'm going to, when I want to have it like a perfect consistency, I'll use my pure juicer. But when I'm really lazy, which is most nights, I'll just use a blend tech blender with like a mini twister, uh, you know, jar and I'll just regular grind it up and then I'll just eat it immediately. So really just depends. Next question is from a 98 J I L L F. Hi, John. Thanks you so much for everything you do for us and thank you for your latest supplement video i'm wondering if you could talk about iron supplements and what if any iron supplements you recommend all right so honestly jill like i don't take an iron supplement i don't have an, a problem with iron myself you know i mean my goal number one is to try to get my nutrients minerals and vitamins and everything i need from the food so if, I, if i'm not eating enough iron you know then I would try to focus on iron-rich foods, right? They'll say meat's high in iron, <laughs> but a lot of you guys don't want to eat any meat or other animal foods. So then I would say, hey, how do the animals get their meat? Well, they eat lots of plants, right? Animals are basically plant concentrators. They eat lots of plants, and then all those minerals accumulate in their cells, and we eat the animals, and we get those minerals secondhand. I would say eat more plants, man, <laughs> like blackstrap molasses if you're not, you know, raw, if you're just trying to get some, you know, iron in you is supposed to be one of the highest vegan foods, highest in minerals. Of course, then after the blackstrap molasses, there's like legumes and beans, you know, can be very high in iron. But then some raw vegans will exclude those foods. Then I'd say next after that would be something like the leafy greens could also be very high in iron as well. That being said, you know. One thing is eating foods with iron. A second thing is absorbing the iron. So it's very important. One of the studies said that, you know, you got to eat vitamin C with your iron. So, hey, maybe make a, a juice or a smoothie out of greens and oranges at the same time, or actually even better than greens and oranges would be greens and bell peppers, which is one of my favorite things. And what I'm eating for dinner tonight, I juice a bunch of bell peppers and then chop up a lot of greens from my garden into it and have like a soup. So, I mean, that's what I would say to you. I'm no expert in iron supplementation. I prefer to get that nutrient from my food and can and have easily done that myself. All right. Next question is from a CMUI1DT. Do you use a water structuring device for the water in your house or to water your garden? That's a good question. So I have some a magnetic kind of structuring device on my water inlet of the house that most of the water that I use goes through that device. Whether that does something or not, I'm not really sure. I do have another kind of magnetic structured water device I want to put in line. I'm research and I'm currently looking into a different one. I think it cannot hurt and can only be helpful personally. Um, otherwise, I don't really do anything to go out of my way to structure my water. Next question is from uh, Angel Leaky Papa Pulu, 30, 1394. Thank you for what you're doing for yourself and all of us. My question is what helps you to not? Be dogmatic about 100% only raw. I am stuck in raw and afraid you add something cooked. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah, I should probably have a whole video on this topic because, I mean, I was, I've was i been dogmatized over the last 20 plus years to learn that, like, 
Cooked food is poison. Cooked food is bad. Don't eat cooked foods. Cooked food is the bane of society. And, you know, now to open up myself to eating small amounts of heat processed food, heated in, you know, very specific methods, you know, and looking at the science, right, and seeing my microbiome tests and knowing that I need to, you know, increase the diversity of my food and I can't do it raw when some foods really need to be heated to be eaten, um... You know, it's it's been a long journey for me also. I mean, even to this day, I default to raw mode, and I don't want to heat anything. And, you know, some of the stuff I make that is heat process, you know, I would rather eat, like, some fresh persimmons like I did for lunch than, you know, some cooked plain beans like I do. So, you know, I probably got to get into a whole video on this. I mean, I think that by the inch, it's a cinch. By the yard, it's hard. You need to start experimenting for yourself. And, you know, if you start experimenting on yourself, and start eating a little bit of heat processed food, you're going to have a lot of like preconceived ideas. I've learned that if you cook food, you're going to get really tired, or this is going to happen, or that's going to happen, or I'm going to get a stomach ache, or this and that. And like, I mean, here's the thing, much like when you transition to raw off cooked foods, right? It was a big step, a big journey. You had some growing pains, but you, you, you know, struggled through it. The same thing and when you go from raw back to eating some heat processed food, and this also depends very much on what you're eating that is cooked or heat processed, right? I'm not talking about going out and eating McDonald's french fries or whatever. I'm talking about eating clean, minimally heated foods that are going to actually benefit you rather than hurt you. You know, I will still say that most cooked foods are quite toxic. They're quite bad. They've been over-processed, ultra-processed, made in a factory. They're not good for you. you want, we want to eat whole foods you know, heated the least amount as possible to make them palatable, to get some extra nutrients and fibers into us. So, you know, I'm probably going to come up with a whole video on this because, I mean, it, it's a, it was a big journey for me. And I say, once again, by the inch, it's a cinch. So just try out a little bit and be aware that if you've been eating raw food for a long time, you eat a little bit of cooked stuff, your bacteria is going to be like, whoa, what is this cooked stuff you're eating, man? You got new fibers coming in, new nutrients. I'm not used to this. So, you know, something may happen to you depending on the strength of your gut microbiome. Like I surmise that if you've been eating all fruit and then go to eating some cooked food, it's going to affect you a lot differently than if you're eating a nice balanced fruit and vegetable diet with a little bit of heat processed food added in, you know, like I did more, more mild. You know, you might want to start off by, hey, if you're already eating greens, right, just steam a little bit of your greens. Steam 10% of the greens that night and add it to your raw salad otherwise, right? you're probably not really going to feel a difference adding that little heat processed foods into your diet. And then slowly, depending on where you're at, start, you know, increasing. Okay, now I could do greens. I feel good with that. Now we're going to add a little bit of beans. Don't go overboard on beans or potatoes or sweet potatoes. And I always encourage you guys to try to find the most nutrient dense foods you're going to heat up. So like purple foods specifically, they can have additional benefits. And also more importantly, foods that you not would not normally eat. In the raw state, that could be also highly beneficial, in my opinion. I just put a link down below to my video on why I started eating heat processed foods. If you're interested in learning more about that, and I hope to have another video in the future where I discuss this in further detail. All right, next question is from a user CS1XZ. What juice do you recommend to yield the highest nutrition for daily wheatgrass shots? A specially dedicated wheatgrass only juicer. Do these exist? No budget, no time constraints, any price. I'm also interested in freeze-dried wheatgrass juice powder to give my parents. They will never drink the shots, but would use a powder. Is there a brand you trust or like for this? All right, highest nutrition for wheatgrass shots. That's a good question. So, like, you just want a slow, single auger masticating juicer. So, like, the slowest one is, like, the Santa 727 that runs at 40 revolutions per minute. That just does a slow grind and crush on wheatgrass. I haven't seen the specific data on using a dedicated stainless steel wheatgrass juicer that could cost, you know, 800 or more dollars, which may run a little bit faster than the 40 RPM of the Santa. Um, I suppose that it's really about ripping open the cell walls of the wheatgrass and extracting the juice out while adding the least, least amount of oxygen. Um, I mean, the other important factor is, you know, how is a wheatgrass being grown what seeds are being used, what amendments like, you know, sea minerals or kelp is being added to the wheatgrass as you grow it. So it actually is more nutritious aside from trying to get the most nutrition out of it. And honestly, if you're not doing shots, I would honestly tell you the best way to get 
the juice out of the wheatgrass is to cut it off, put it in your mouth, and chew it and suck the juice out. That's the lowest RPM. You're going to get the most juice, minimal oxidation. That being said, I also demonstrate, link down below to that, where I can extract wheatgrass juice using a vacuum blender, which I believe is going to make a higher quality juice. But the downside with that is that you can't do straight wheatgrass. You will have to use other, other you know, vegetables such as celery or even cucumbers uh, to make that happen. So uh, then I would say the wheatgrass for your parents, wheatgrass juice, I would say number one, get wheatgrass juice powder versus dried wheatgrass powder. Wheatgrass juice powder is going to be more concentrated. Now the other thing I'm going to say, which kind of goes against a lot of the things I say, I generally say that freeze-dried is superior than traditionally drying. That being said, there is research out there that shows refractants window drying is superior than freeze drying if the item can be refractants window dried. <laughs> so things that can be refractants window dried are only things that are like juices or smoothie texture. Whole pieces of fruit cannot be refractants window dried. Refractants window dried also takes large equipment that you cannot own at home like you can like I own a freeze dryer, the Stay Fresh freeze dryer, link down below to my video where I visit the factory. I'll soon have unboxing videos on my channel and show how to use a freeze dryer. That being said, so I would recommend Refractin's Window Dried Wheatgrass Juice. The only company I know that sells one is Organic Traditions, and I know the owner of that company. Um, he's a, a fellow raw foodist, actually. He, that company makes some of the highest quality stuff out there, so I would say it's going to cost you a pretty penny, but go for that one. Next question is from uh, Oro Raraguri4431. I'm not good at names. All right. Hi, John. Thanks so much for all the info you share. How much fat do you eat per day? What do you think about using fats such as avocado and various seeds, nuts, pre-soaked and used as a dressing? What do you think about cooking whole sweet potatoes in the oven? Greetings from Italy. All right. How much fat do I eat per day? That's a good question. So today I had some beans. I had some, I had a green juice. I had a whole bunch of persimmons and I had about a handful of sacha inchi seeds whole. Um, those have been heat uh, processed. And then for dinner, I'm going to have like a big raw soup that has some like cashew cheese and macadamia nuts blended into the soup base, but like a small fraction of, of it. And then actually it does have some avocado in there as well. So I do eat whole food sources of fat. And then for dessert, I might have like some steamed potato, sweet potatoes, purple sweet potatoes, or steamed artichoke. Not really sure yet what I'm feeling like. Um, so, you know, in general, here's this, like, I don't eat like a really low fat diet. You know, I personally try to get between 15% to 25% of my calories from fat. You know, some people say that's too much. You know, some people will say that's too little. <laughs> that being said, it's always a varying target. I never try to do some kind of exact number. And honestly, I don't really track it. My goal is to, you know, eat plenty of vegetables, whole bunch of fruits, eat some nuts and seeds, don't like necessarily restrict myself, but I don't sit there with a bag of cashews and start shoveling them in either, you know, but maybe a handful, two handfuls a day, some avocado. These days I'm not really focusing on coconut, I'm trying to get the saturated fats out of my diet. Um, eat a little bit of olive, high quality olive oil here and there, you know, uh, that's about it. And the high quality olive oil is 2000 polyphenol olive oil, higher than most, what most doctors would recommend, Dr. Gundry's olive oil or the guy that's doing the, you know, whatever, $5 million anti-aging thing, Brian Johnson, like his, his all of the, they're, they're like our 700, 800, you know, parts, you know, uh, milligrams. And mine's like 2000 and it's $90 a bottle when it's a $90 bottle of olive oil. Trust me, I'm not dousing everything with olive oil. I'm putting just a little bit so I have to keep buying the bottles too quick. All right. And then what do I think about using fats such as avocado and various seeds nuts pre-soaked and used for dressing i think that is great that's actually what i do and have been doing for the majority of my raw food career uh, most of it actually I've, i haven't really soaked pre-soaked the nuts that will actually lower the fat content may take out some enzyme inhibitors may start the sprouting process if that nuts are actually not heat treated before you buy them in the case of cashews most cashews it'll never do nothing because they've already been steamed so I think that could be good, yes. I mean, I don't pre-soak things because I'm just too lazy and can never plan ahead that far in advance. <laughs> that being said, I do like to use, like, if you're going to take the time to pre-soak them, you might as well soak them, blend them, and then let, ferment them a little bit, make them into, like, a seed cheese to actually add some beneficial probiotics in there. I, could, I think that could take it to the next level. Like, yesterday I used, like, uh, you know, cashew cheese 
as the as as the fat in my soup um, recipe when I blended up the bell, fresh bell pepper juice. All right. And what do you think about cooking whole sweet potatoes in the oven? So I mean, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't cook whole sweet potatoes in the oven. While I do eat some heat processed food, I will not heat things up in the oven. Um, you know. There, there could be benefits, but there's also significant drawbacks to that. Number one, you, if you're heating things in the oven, you could go too hot. You could create carcinogens, create toxins. I mean, and they could create browning. It's also being done in a dry environment, which is definitely, the studies show that that's definitely not a good thing for nutrition. Um, can Yeah, it's just not good. <laughs> so I don't, I don't recommend that. But, you know, hey, if it, you know, you got to look at what you're doing otherwise. Hey, if you, the options are, hey, you're going to cook a sweet potato in the oven, and I encourage you to find a purple sweet potato, which is already going to up your, you know, health benefits from the sweet potato because it actually has less sugar and actually more polyphenols, um, you know, and the option is, hey, baked sweet potato or I go out to McDonald's. I mean, I don't have to tell you guys that a baked sweet potato is way healthier than McDonald's. You know, for me, baked sweet potato or a, a steamed sweet potato in the Instant Pot you know, I'm going to do an Instant Pot sweet potato every single time. Yes, I may miss the crunchy texture, and I don't really know what that tastes like because I don't cook things in the oven, and I don't want that crunchy texture because that crunchy texture, when things turn brown, are the carcinogens and toxins you guys are eating. You know, so these are just my opinions, and if you, if you, if you can't steam it or you don't have an Instant Pot, I mean, at least boil it maybe and just drink the boiling water. I mean, I would just say invest in an Instant Pot or some kind of, you know, automatic pressure cooker. It's like the best thing you could ever own if you want to heat process your food and, and disconnect your oven. My oven is still disconnected. That's probably, I mean, one of the worst ways to cook food, in my opinion, and unfortunately. It's the most used way that most people cook their food, unfortunately. All right, next question is from a green health lifestyle. I'm a big fan of chips and dips. Chips and plant-based cheese dips, salsa, guac, whatever. What are some other things I can dip that are healthier besides uh, chips, celery, and carrots are not my favorite for dipping. Do you have any other unique recommendations? Yes. So I would say, you know, try some jicama. They have jicama chips these days sold at many stores. They have jicama fries you could actually dip. I love jicama. It has a really neutral flavor, nice and crunchy. I would always recommend using different kinds of vegetables. You could slice up, slice up some radishes, slice up beets. You know, you didn't like carrots or... Um, celery slice up cucumbers i mean just I, I just take leaves i'll pick leaves up right i'll take a leaf i'll take a leaf and then i'll roll it up right i'll just roll it up like this and then i just dip this into the dressing and you eat it right <laughs> so you could dip a lot of things i mean and so if you don't want to if you don't want to do fresh vegetables right then i would recommend you going with some dehydrated things right so there's a really cool company got you know, uh, told about it by my friends, Nate and Lissa. I think it's called a uh, Home Healthy Harvest. I forget. But it, they make these little, like, cracker things that are dehydrated. You know, they're like almond flour. And they actually taste like che Cheez-Its <laughs> or, or something. So I love those. Sometimes I'll dip those, but a lot of times I'll just eat them plain. I mean, you could just basically make dehydrated flax crackers. You can make dehydrated pulp crackers. Get a dehydrator. You can make so many crazy different kinds of crackers in a dehydrator with fruits vegetables and other plant foods right i mean when i travel sometimes i'll get these things called flackers which are dehydrated flax crackers there's so many different things you could dip that you know if you go to the sprouts farmer's market they have like brad's raw foods he has a whole bunch of different kind of like crackers made out of like you know dehydrated carrots and flax seeds and sometimes even kale or other things those are great for dipping as well all right next question is from a uh, C. Buchanan 4458, I bought a vegetable spiralizer to make raw noodles to get away from pasta, but whenever I eat it like that upsets my stomach. Any suggestions on why this is happening? I use raw zucchini squash and yellow squash. That is a good question. You know, I would say go consult a doctor. <laughs> I don't really know. I would say, you know, number one, I would say make sure you're using organic vegetables. Uh, number two is... I would ask yourself, do you often consume raw zucchini otherwise? And if you've never consumed or barely ever consumed raw zucchini before, then I would say it's a new food that you're introducing to your body and your, you know, your body or gut microbiome is not used to it and is rebelling against you. So then what I would say is then you want to ease into putting it and adding it to your food. So if you're used to making pasta spaghetti, hey, that's great. 
make 80% pasta spaghetti like you normally would, and then spiralize the 20% of the raw pasta with, uh, you know, zucchinis and whatnot, and then add that to your cooked pasta, and then mix it all up, right? Then eat it, and tell me if you get a reaction. If you get a reaction, right, then, hey, maybe you're really sensitive to the raw zucchini pasta. You maybe have to cut it down to 10%, and then 10%, maybe you don't get a reaction, and then just keep that up for like a month, man. Your body will start to like get your regular pasta. It'll be happy. You'll start getting a little bit of the, you know, the zucchini pasta. Your body will start getting used to it. And then slowly over time, increase the percentage to 20%. Keep that up for a little bit. Increase it to 30%. Keep that up for a little bit. And keep going until you get to 100%. And then one day, hopefully, you'll be able to tolerate it if you've never been able to tolerate it before. I mean, another thought is if you, if you are eating cooked pasta, you might as well just make the raw zucchini pasta and then cook it and then eat it and then see if it affects you to find out if it's something in the raw versus cooked and i don't know maybe take some enzymes i have no idea so those are just some strategies that i would recommend to you not knowing your whole situation because there's many things that could be occurring with that all right next question is from a broad castle table john i need a new power supply for my bio chef vacuum attachment i purchased from you one of the leads broke I would solder it, but it's right up against the AC to DC transformer plug. I'm going to have to cut into the 9-volt transformer to get enough wire to work with. Do you have any on hand, and how much are they? Thanks, Dave. All right, Dave. So I, I my relationship with BioChef definitely gone south. They don't respond to my emails. I don't believe they're even selling products in the United States anymore, and I don't even know if they're even in business in Australia which is where they are from. That being said, that 9-volt adapter is not something special. It is an off-the-shelf adapter. So the main thing is you want to measure the plug, uh, you know, uh, size. You could go on Amazon and just look up 9-volt adapter and make sure the polarity is correct, you know, the center um, and the outside being positive or negative and having them correct. It says it on the transformer of the BioChef. So you could look on that and then just match it up. And the cool thing about Amazon, if you try to buy one, you plug it in, it doesn't work, then send it back, right? Just make sure you buy it when it has Prime and it's not a third-party seller. I've been burned before by buying from third-party sellers on Amazon. So, yeah, hope that helps you out there. Uh, next question is from user CS1XZ. Do you think there is any merit to people saying there are a very few raw vegans who have lived 100 or close to it? All right, so I, I would say, actually, there are very few raw vegans that have lived to 100 or close to it. I mean, so that includes me. I have not seen nor met many raw vegans that live to 100. I mean, I've heard of some, like Dr. Norman Walker, you know, uh, Jay Cordage, the juice man. You know, he, he ate lots of raw, maybe not exclusively, lived almost to 100, um, you know. So, I mean, there are people in history that have lived really long. I think typically they tend to be juicers. <laughs> that being said, general raw vegans I've known throughout the years you know, because I've been doing this a long time, I haven't seen people get super old on this diet. So, you know, if that concerns you, then you might want to look at, like, how do people that live longer live? Well, generally they're plant-based. Generally they heat process their food. While I do think that being raw vegan can have many advantages, I think it also can have some disadvantages, especially with your microbiome. Um, and especially with, you know, certain omega fatty acids, because I've also seen and heard stories of raw vegans having dementia in their older years. So, um, you know, that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> Next question from a green health lifestyle. Hey, John, I hope you have a great day. How much water should I drink every day to improve my digestion? I'm feeling dehydrated. How much liquid, say juice and water, should I be drinking to live optimal. All right, so I'm not going to tell you how much water you should drink because I am not you. <laughs> I will say how much water I drink, right? So in the winter time, I generally would drink like 500 milliliters or half a liter of fractionally distilled bottled water a day. Um, I don't pretty much drink any other water. Maybe rare days, if I'm feeling dehydrated, I might grab another liter to drink. That being said, I, however, do hydrate with juices. So generally, I like to drink either one or two liters of fresh juice a day. Lately, it has been one liter. I drink normally my morning green juice, and I've been, I haven't had time to make my second juice and have them prepped in my fridge. So I haven't been drinking 
juice lately, in which case I may make a smoothie or just eat more watery fruit, right? Right now I am feeling like I should have drank some water and I am feeling a bit dehydrated. And if, if, if that happens to you, then you know, hey, I'm feeling dehydrated and I always feel dehydrated around four o'clock, right? Then at three o'clock or two o'clock, before you even feel dehydrated, you already should have tried to drink something, right? My goal is to not hydrate with just water. My, my goal is to hydrate through fruits and vegetables and other high water content plant foods. So that's why I'm a big advocate for juicing. If you don't want to do juicing, that's all right. Make a big smoothie, you know, with vegetables, with water. I like to get my water through my vegetables, not necessarily by adding additional water into my diet. So yeah, so my, in the summertime, I might drink two to three quarts of juice and then have one liter water pretty much every day. Um, so, and then of course that's on top of eating pretty much a water rich diet. All, everything I eat generally is like fresh fruits or vegetables, have lots of water. Even the things that I eat that are heat processed, that are steamed, right? They're not baked. They're rich in water too because they have all the water from the heating process. Like I had artichoke hearts last night. I mean, they're quite water rich when you steam them. They actually have probably more water when you steam them <laughs> than when they're raw. <laughs> so go figure that one. Next question is from Naughty. Organesis. John, quick question. Can you do a video on measuring the nitrate levels of my fresh juice? I want to stay below a certain level per day and juice beats quite often. Not sure if there are test strips or any device that could measure this. All right, so I have never measured nitrate levels in juice. That being said, I did interview a nitrate expert. Um, I think his name was Nathan Bryan. Link down below to that video. And in that video, I, when I'm talking to him, Right, he reveals to me that organic produce did not have the highest nitrate levels. And I'm like thinking in my head, that does not compute. Organic's always better than conventional, right? <laughs> but then when he explained it, and then I thought about it more, I'm like, oh, that makes perfect sense. He said conventional produce has more nitrate in the beets than organic. And here's why is because when you're using when you're eating and buying conventional produce, they're adding nitrate-based fertilizers, ammonium nitrate to basically get the nitrogen into the plants so the plants grow in abnormally high levels. So number one, I would say, is you want to use organic produce, right? It's going to have lower nitrate levels in it. Of course, there are plant foods that are higher in nitrate, plant foods that are lower in nitrate. And if you're concerned about the nitrate, then I would say, you know, juice less leafy greens and beets or moderate and don't juice too many of them. So don't go crazy on those items. Now, the other thing I'll say is that many years ago, I bought a nitrate tester, right, to test your food. So there are some available on Amazon. I don't know the efficacy or if even if they're legit or they work, but I know that they do sell nitrate testers. One of the nitrate testers, like the one I bought years ago, you could stick in food. It'll tell you if the food is a green light or a red light. It'd be a red light if the nitrate levels were way too high because that also could be quite toxic. And I guess also if you're eating animal products or actually cured animal products, like my mom wouldn't let us have sodium nitrate hot dogs when I was a kid, which is probably a good thing. <laughs> so, so that's what I'm going to say. There are meters out there. I don't know the efficacy. And I would say buy organic produce, not conventional, to lower your nitrate levels in your juices. All right, next question is from uh, Look No Book. <laughs> Hi, John. I believe both raw vegans and carnivores are taking it too far. How about clean, grass-fed meat, pasture-raised eggs, and a wide variety of organic greens and fruit? Could the key be lowering carbs? Are we overthinking it? What is your opinion? All right, good question. So a true vegan channel would not answer this question. Um, that being said, I'll just tell you guys like I believe it and more importantly what the science says. So here's the thing, like I just did another microbiome test. This was a more expensive shotgun test. And I, actually in my microbiome test, it's telling me that I need to eat more meat because some of my bacteria in my gut, you know, <laughs> They like the vegetables too much and it's really increasing and overgrowing some certain bacteria species that I'm really doing a good job at feeding at and I'm, I'm not giving, you know, I'm not eating other foods that are not feeding them, such as meat and stuff. So in terms of my personal microbiome, you know, that's what this results of this tell, is telling me. I'm not at the point where I'm going to do that at all due to, you know, my many beliefs about animal foods uh, for many reasons. So that being said, I'm going to tell you guys what the science says. And, you know, to me, the science is clear, right? We need to eat mostly a whole food, plant-based diet. And if you want to include meat and other animal products, it should make up no more than 10% maximum. 5% would be even better. 
of your diet and also not just any old plant foods you know you want to eat for you nutrition for you and your microbiome most people do not take that into consideration also too of course animal foods can concentrate to environmental toxins uh, you know and with animal foods they could ha it comes with good and bad <laughs> of course one of the bad things is that the animals in many cases have to lose their lives or be treated inhumanely uh, to produce those foods unless of course you're doing it yourself and you know making your own eggs for example and treat your chickens well or if you eat roadkill <laughs> to eat your meat and you don't actually you know intentionally kill an animal to eat it you know my goal is to leave the lightest footprint on the planet and at this point i don't believe in eating animals that being said you know i'm not going to try to t talk you out of eating animals but i what i will talk you into is i want to talk you into eating more whole food plants eating the most of them as possible and also more importantly getting a microbiome check because you know microbiome experts are clear right they will say a long-term carnivore diet will definitely hurt your health yeah, an imbalanced vegan diet could also potentially hurt your health, but a long-term carnivore diet is going to hurt your health more because the problem now is you have some really bad bacteria, and these bad bacteria, for lack of a better word, poop out these endotoxins, and they cause and wreak havoc. So while a carnivore diet may feel good for you now, right, and work for you temporarily, I believe in the long run, you are sacrificing your health. And everybody gets to choose what they want to do with their life, you know. I mean, I also feel bad for people that are carnivore that eat so many animals and so many animals have to die and lose their lives to eat. But you know what? Everybody's going to do what they want to do. And I'm just here sharing my personal opinions and sharing with you guys how I live, which is growing my own vegetables, trying to eat the highest quality and eat a diversity to feed me and my microbiome. And so far, it's been working out great. So that's what I'm going to say. I, I could, you know, so Yeah. I think that people need to dial in and tailor their diet to their microbiome. In some cases, that may be reducing their carbs. And of course, I think most Americans need to reduce their bad carbs because most people eat carbs that are not healthy carbs, processed food, carbs, ultra processed food, even ultra processed food, animal foods, definitely not healthy. Want to get back to eating more natural foods, whatever you guys do. All right, we're down to the last question from uh, Donatina, 1987. Hi, John. Are there whole plant-based foods that you would advise not to eat? For example, grains, legumes. And if there is an animal food that you would recommend, e.g. fish, all right? So, so, you know, here's the thing. Like, for me personally, my goal is to include every different kind of plant food that I could include in my diet. If I could eat it raw, great. And if I have to heat process it in the Instant Pot, I will do that because I believe eating a diversity. And I've seen eating a diversity as positively affected my microbiome and in increased my microbiome diversity by 25%, which I believe is linked to better and longer health outcomes in the future. Um, so I don't really restrict any foods. That being said, each person may have different food allergies and some foods may not be good for them. Uh, that being said, I recently heard a podcast with a microbiome expert where he said, you know, gluten intolerance could be caused by microbiome imbalance. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is like mind blowing. So like the microbiome is connected to so many things and so many people, unfortunately, do not even consider it. Also too, of course, you know, your microbiome, if you haven't been eating purple sweet potatoes for like 20 years, like I never ate purple sweet potatoes because I never cooked them and I'd barely ever eat them raw, right? And then you start eating them and then you're like, oh man, my, my stomach hurts or I'm, I'm tripping out or my, you know, I got a stomach ache or I'm feeling nauseous. It's because you're your body's not used to it, right? So once again, you got to start including it in small amounts and, and work your way up so that you don't overload your system if your you know, system is fragile and your system is not resilient. And if you are not resilient, I'm like, I'm going to say that's great that you're finding out you're not resilient now before it's too late when being not resilient in the future could hurt your health a lot more. So, you know, I would, I would say include all different kinds of plant foods that are properly processed. I mean, when I was a raw vegan, definitely I'm avoiding all kidney beans because if you try to eat kidney beans sprouted or raw, it's going to kill you. So, you know, in that case, depending on your dietary restrictions, but if you're heat processing things like I am, you know, I would say any plant food is fair game for this mouth. <laughs> and, you know, I would say actually... The thing you don't want to avoid is beans. I hope to have an upcoming video on that. Beans, I mean, next to fruits and vegetables, are some of the most important foods, aside from mushrooms, on the planet that, unfortunately, not enough people eat. There's so many published studies on the benefits of 
beans and the microbiome, longevity in beans. I mean, I would say you definitely want to try to include some beans and find some beans that you like and you enjoy because there's so many different types. Okay, and then is there an animal food that you would recommend? So I'm not here to recommend any necessarily animal food to you guys. You know, I would recommend algaes if you guys want to eat some kind of like, you know, concentrated nutrition food. That being said, I'll tell you what the science says. And in general, you know, things like red meat and chicken generally don't fare too well in science. That being said, usually in science that the fish, as long as it's non-contaminated, although in many cases they don't, uh, you know, say that in the studies, you know, has been linked with positive health outcomes. That being said, don't eat too much fish either. You want to eat mostly plants, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, and less than 10% or even better yet, 5% of your calories from fish. What does that mean? That means a big plate of, you know, salad and greens some beans and other plant foods and a small side of fish if you choose to eat it, you know. And I just tell like the science says, right? And I mean, that's what I'm going to tell you guys. I mean, yeah, for, for the animal's sake, I would say, yeah, do we need to eat fish? What nutrients are actually in fish that we are getting that is actually increasing our health? Is it the astaxanthin that we could actually get through a supplement? Is it the omega, you know, uh, DHA and EPA that we could also supplement? So my, my solution at this point in my life is to eat the greens that also has, you know, omega-3s, but also I supplement DHA, EPA, as well as things like astaxanthin and other properties in the fish so that I don't have to eat fish, you know, and I mean, it might be a lot easier just to eat fish. <laughs> I do feed my dog fish, <laughs> you know. Um, he eats the sardines from Trader Joe's, which are actually quite clean. They're just packed in water, no salt. And so I buy them from him. I mean, he is a carnivore, you know, so he gets that as a treat every rare blue moon, right? Because I don't want to neglect him and have him, his health hurt by me putting my dietary lifestyle on him. And recently, I, you know, I did have to go to the animal hospital with him and find out that he has an enlarged heart, which may have been caused by feeding him too many plants and not enough animal foods over his life and or it may be due to he is a small breed dog. I'm not exactly sure, but, you know, I'm kind of feeling a little bit guilty these days for feeding him too many plants and maybe not enough animals. Um, so this is something for you guys that want to consider that you guys may have pets that you love. All right, so that's pretty much it for this month's Q&A. If you guys enjoyed this Q&A, hey, please be sure to give this video a big thumbs up. Also, more importantly, share this with other people you feel it could help that'll help get the YouTube algorithm ranking this video a little bit better so to get more widely viewed and I would appreciate that also be sure to click that subscribe button right down below so you're missing my new upcoming episodes I've come in every five to seven days you never know where I show up or what you'd be learning on my YouTube channel make sure you click the little bell so you know that as my new videos come out and finally be sure to check my past episodes the past episodes are a wealth of knowledge over 800 episodes at this time on the channel dedicated to you guys all about how to eat more fresh fruits and vegetables and other plant food so you can get super healthy. So with that, my name is John Kohler with OKRaw.com. We'll see you next time. And until then, remember, keep eating your fresh fruits and vegetables. They're always the best.